Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 20, titled Too Much Too Late. The penultimate. I'm going to use that word a bunch because I, I really love that word. It makes me sound fancy. Put my, <laughs> put my pinky up when I say it. The penultimate episode of Season 5 and all of Miami Vice. Now, I'm going to say I am so happy that we watched it in this order. And I'll get deeper into that in our final thoughts. But this should be episode 20 and Free Fall should be episode 21. Or this should be episode 16 and then Free Fall was episode 17. This is the natural place for this. I want to get too long into that. We'll talk about that later. I'm glad you're taking a while to explain it because I had to look up what Pan Ultimate or whatever <laughs> actually meant. It originally premiered on January 25th, 1990. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a second to explain a little bit about this episode. This episode never aired on NBC or USA. At the time, it was considered to be too risque for TV, and they didn't air it at all. It didn't air again until the reruns started. And that's why it shows up in January 25th, 1990. And then it's like one of the most highly praised episodes of Miami My- Vice ever. This episode shows up every week on Law and Order SVU. <laughs> That's what the whole the whole SVU is about. No? Same <laughs> episode every week. <laughs> <laughs> Another point on why it's good to be watched in this episode because in reruns, this one comes on before Freefall. So when the show originally came out, it's a lost episode, never actually aired. And then a year later in reruns, it does. But in reruns, this one comes on before Freefall. Like it should be. <laughs> yeah, and, and it makes the way the characters, with what's going on with the characters in this episode, I think it better sets up Freefall. At least it would seem. I don't know, we haven't watched Freefall yet. I could be completely wrong. There's some more hints here as far as like this is the right order. It is written by John Connor. He never wrote anything else except for this episode, not just for Vice, but forever, <laughs> because the T-1000 was busy chasing him down. <laughs> he, he, he's just always on the run. <laughs> he couldn't write any more TV shows. It is directed by Richard Compton, who also directed Down for the Count Part 1 and 2, which is interesting because he's going to like circle back around on the Zito storyline here it's not the snow globes aren't a zito thing necessarily i mean no they are oh that's right that's, it what, I, is. that's what i was telling you he gave them those okay. uh-huh. yeah that's right that's what it was yeah. that's how we got him i was like drawing a total blank and how we got him but so he does circle all the way back around on the zito storyline here and he also directed everybody's in showbiz the big thaw mirror image just to name a few he's got more than that that he directed He was put into this spot on purpose. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do something with this. (laughs) Now, before we get started on this episode, normally we check in with what's happening in our lives, but just going to set the stage here for how this Go With The Heat podcast is going to end. We are talking about too much too late today. Next week, we are going to have a special free fall episode that's going to be like a um, a primer for free fall because we're that excited for it. So there'll be a primer episode for free fall because it is so huge. We got to break it up into two episodes. That'll happen next week. It's also a very long episode. Yes. It's it's incredibly important because it's the last episode of Miami Vice and like the second to last episode to go with the heat <laughs> because we're going to do free fall. And then, one, then the following week, we'll do our, our normal season five recap with our clip show. And then after that will be our go with the heat and Miami Vice total review of all seasons and where we stand with Miami Vice. And just letting it all air it out now that me and John have seen it all the way through. And Melissa has seen it through for like the 19th time or whatever. <laughs> she can finally get some stuff off her chest. <laughs> and then that's going to be and, it. And then after that, a change of format. And we'll probably be in the adult contemporary station. <laughs> <laughs> and then that'll be it for the podcast, too. We'll be officially retiring the podcast at the end of that whole show recap that will happen in four weeks. So in a month. That'll be our final episode. Next four episodes are the this one plus three more are our last episodes ever to come out. Now, if Miami Vice does do a reboot, we will be back for the reboot. I'm scared of it because I don't know who's going to be in Good it. Good or bad. <laughs> Good Ugly or bad. Or bad. <laughs> we'll be back for it. I don't know for how long, <laughs> but we will be back for our Miami Sorry, Vice reboot. Scott otherwise, Con- we are retired. <laughs> but otherwise, we are retired after these episodes these last couple episodes we'd love for you to stick around and finish off the show with us and get to these final couple episodes we'd love to hear from you in 
what you think about these final episodes, that email, go with the at gmail.com. And uh, we'd love to talk with you before this show comes to an official end, even if it's just a thank you note or I wish you guys would have done it this way or wh whatever it is. We would love to hear from you before we officially retire. But before we get there, let's go talk about Too Much Too Late because this is an amazing episode. Easily, uh, I might say the best episode of season five. Now, I know there's some amnesia shows that were in here, but uh, just saying, let's go break this one down. When we open up, we're on Hooker Row. Oh, Hooker Row. So many great memories. <laughs> oh, finally, we're back. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've been on Hooker Row. I know. And I'm going to miss it so much. When we eventually do get down to Miami, I'm just going to be one of the things I'm going to be sad that doesn't exist anymore. Well, it's just a different row. I'm sure they got one. <laughs> it's just not called Hooker Row. <laughs> There are so many great memories on the street. So many foreign dignitaries. <laughs> Getting away with murder. <laughs> <laughs> but what we're really here for is that a woman is at home. Her name is Yvonne and with her daughter, Lynette. And she has her, her drug dealer there. And she's trying to say, I have no money. I know I owe you money. But I need some drugs bad. Will you spot me? And Swain is having absolutely none of that. And starts just destroying the house. It, them crackhead deals. Like she's go, she's breaking it down. How it's going to somehow work out for him. Gives her the crack now. And gets the money later. You know like the old. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger of the day. She tries every single oh, day. Yeah. Oh yeah. Dude just goes nuts man. He destroys the crap out of the house. Starts beating her up. The show just opens like heavy. Like just hits you like that. Oh yeah. It's a it's a cold punch to the face to see what's happening here. Because Lynette who's got to be what? 13? Yeah I think she's like 13 or 14. Yeah 13, 14. She's watching all of it happen. Crying. Watching her mom. Goes into her room. Calls valerie in new york and says my mom's been using again and now her dealer's coming around and he's beating her up and i'm really afraid of him valerie says don't don't go anywhere stay right there i'm gonna come help valerie hangs up the phone and immediately calls tubs and says who he just happens to be working late that night he says i'll send a patrol car over she says no family do this as a family favor so he goes over just as a friend over to Yvonne's house when he shows up that's when Swain is beating her up really bad Lynette tries to get in between he says you're next and that's when Tubbs comes busting in and Swain runs through that house like he knew the bus was coming <laughs> yeah exactly I'm out of here oh. <laughs> he turned tail quick as soon as Tubbs came flying in that door luckily everyone in Miami has a convertible so he just runs and jumps <laughs> Jump over the door and drives away <laughs> Uh, almost looked like he drove the same type of car Tubbs drives. He was stealing Tubbs' car and just left. Everyone's got the same car. Mm -hmm. that's like, that looked like that's what Stan had later on, the same mm -hmm. car. Like, yeah. oh. Tubbs is there with Lynette and Yvonne, and then we go to the opening credits. Now, this is our chance to check in with this week's guest stars. And as John mentioned, this is a deep, heavy, heart string tugging episode part of that is because we have amazing guest stars that make appearances in this one yeah they did a really good job and this isn't like your average miami vice let's reuse dennis farina for the 18th time <laughs> we do have a repeat the fabulous pam greer comes back as detective valerie gordon now she's a reoccurring character we happily get a little bit more pam greer before the show ends she showed up in episodes Rites of Passage and Prodigal Son. And, I mean, come on, it's Foxy Brown. So, uh, I don't think I need to explain any more about who Pam Greer is. The only thing that I learned in reading through this episode is I, I had totally forgot that she appears in Crime Story, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, is that there's there are other Vice connections. She was in seven episodes of Crime Story, and she popped up in Dick Wolf's Law & Order SVU, possibly doing this episode. <laughs> I wanted to just throw out one more fact that you might not know about Pam Greer, since we've already talked about her a few times. She has the same birthday as Philip Michael Thomas. Weird. <laughs> yeah, small world. I don't know. I wonder if they were ever a thing. Yeah. Uh, uh. Mm -hmm. saying. <laughs> he's got like 11 kids they're <laughs> awfully good on screen together. yeah exactly our next guest star is melinda williams she plays lynette she's an actress and producer and she's been in a bunch of stuff she starred as tracy bird van adams in sh in the showtime series soul food from 2000 to 2004 
She was also the same character in the movie Soul Food that inspired the series. But I mean, even at this point in Vice, she's already been a guest star on an episode of The Cosby Show. But she was also appearing in other TV shows, My So-Called Life, Sister Sister, Moesha, NYPD Blue. So she also did other cop shows. But she was just, she popped up in a lot of popular shows in the 90s. She's also been in some pretty good movies. Thin Line Between Love and Hate, High School High, which is a very underrated comedy, and The Wood, Lovett, just to name a few. Damn, actually, yeah. So, all, she was, damn, she's in a lot of good She movies. was actually married to Makai Pfeiffer, who was also in The Wood. So, outside of success on TV and movies, she's also the host of the talk show Exhale on the, on the network Aspire since 2013. Our next guest star is John Tolls Bay, who plays Billy Swain, our drug deal, uh, crack dealer in the episode. He was an actor and a writer. As far as movies go, he was in some pretty random movies. Dude, Where's My Car? Waterworld, K-Pax, and Midnight Run are the like mi- big ones. He actually wrote the screenplay for the movie A Rage in Harlem in 1991, it actually sounds like a pretty decent movie. It's got Forrest Whitaker, Robin Givens, and Gregory Hines in it. Wow. And then he has a bunch of one to two episode appearances on shows like Matlock, The Flash, which there's been a lot of people connected to that early 90s <laughs> Flash show. I still haven't figured out why. <laughs> also, NYPD Blue. He showed up in an NYPD Blue episode and an episode of Martin. I wonder how many of our guest stars had to look at Dennis Francis' ass. A lot of people that were in NYPD Blue. <laughs> oh, for the record, his ass is only in like two episodes. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's a requirement if you're going to be on the show. You, you have had to, to look stand at around ass. and watch those scenes. Everyone, everyone had to like everyone got around. Now Jimmy Smith's ass. <laughs> he's in like every episode he's in. You see his ass. I got notes. <laughs> I took notes on it. Our next guest star is June Gable. She plays Doctor Ellen Hardy. She's a, a American character actress. She's probably best known for her role as Joey's agent Estelle Leonard on the embassy <gasps> sitcom Friends. Oh my god, that is her! <laughs> She's actually a Tony Award winning Broadway actress. Most of her acting in TV and film are, are like is like that. So she played Detective Batista in the third season of Barney Miller. In 79, she appeared as Rhoda Ruder on Hanna-Barbera's live-action Legends of the Superheroes. <laughs> I didn't know Hanna-Barbera made a live-action superhero show. Yeah, and the fact her odd. character's name was Rhoda Ruder, that, that's just awesome. I've got to find that. <laughs> From 78 to 81, she was a regular on a variety series called Sha Na Na. She was also on Laughing. Got some serious comedy chops. She had a reoccurring role on HBO's comedy series Dream On from 90 to 96. But we can't escape without another Vice reference, and she was also made a guest appearance in an episode of Crime Story. (laughs) Our last guest star is CCH Pounder, who plays Yvonne. She is a Guyanese-American actress. She has been in a ton of theater, film, and TV. Her most notable roles... No. Yeah, she is, she is everywhere. everywhere. All right, so some of her most notable roles include Dr. Angela Hicks on The R, Detective Claudette Wims on The Shield, Mo At in the Avatar movies, Miss Irene Frederick in Warehouse 13. Kind of threw that in because that's one of my little sci-fi channel shows. <laughs> I threw it in there because there's no Crossing Jordan reference, and I'm a little upset about that. We made it, Mulsa. We no Crossing it. Jordan. High five. <laughs> She also played D.A. Tyne Patterson on Sons of Anarchy and Dr. Loretta Wade, most recently on NCIS New Orleans. So she actually made her acting debut in 1979 in the film All That Jazz. Other movies she's been in, she has starred in Baghdad Cafe, Benny and June, Robocop 3, Tales from the Crypt Demon Night, Face Off, End of Days. She also has a bunch of voice acting. She was in one of her more recent ones is Godzilla's King of the Monsters, which just came out. She's also done voice acting for the Gargoyles TV show, Justice League Unlimited, did a voice on Archer in an episode. Yeah, she is all up in our world. 
Like yeah, I know. Everything that we yeah. watch. <laughs> yeah. I remember on Gargoyles, oh, yeah. for sure. I remember that. Uh, and some of her other TV roles, uh, outside of the ones already named, uh, she did three episodes of Hill Street Blues, four episodes of L.A. Law, in case you needed another Vice connection, two episodes of The X-Files, an episode of Quantum Leap. So <laughs> just, yeah, just all over the place. She is also a very notable advocate for awareness of post-apartheid South Africa, mm. as well as the HIV AIDS crisis going on in mm. Africa. She's a superstar. She's a big get. Even back at Vice Day. And when you see her, you immediately recognize, like, oh yeah, I have seen her in, and then insert three shows. And you can tell on her performance. Mm-hmm. She's outstanding in this mm-hmm. episode. Yep. When we come back from the opening credits or back at the hospital, Tubbs comes in and check on Yvonne. But Yvonne is fighting back with Tubbs and telling Lynette to be quiet. And she is clearly, you are not welcome here. And I'm not going to give you any additional information. Tubbs leaves and Lynette tries to go tell Tubbs. But Yvonne tells her, that's my only connection. I have a lot of pain inside. Please don't take this away from me. I'm just not ready yet for this. And as you mentioned, John, in the beginning, it's such a heavy episode right from the start when we get to this scene. And th- I mm-hmm. wanted to take just a moment to mention that Vice normally does junkies not the best way. Like a no. caricature of mm-hmm. what a junkie, what you yeah. expect a junkie to be. But in this moment, we get a real junkie, which is she knows she has yes. a problem. She wants to take care of her daughter. But there's an underlying reason that makes her use And it's the true story of a junkie, which there's a whole bunch of reasons why they're drug users and why they think they need them. How hard it is to get off of that because of that underlying pain. She's sitting in the hospital. She just got beat up by this guy. And her inclination is is that she's jonesing gore so bad that trying to talk herself into going right back to the guy that just put her in the hospital because he's the only one that can take care of her. She can't stop herself. The drug has taken a hold of her so strongly. And you can tell that when she's clean, she's probably a great person, which is another story of a real person with a drug problem. Valerie and Lynette are both crazy about her. And they know like if we could just get the drugs out of her, then we love her. Uh, on a side note, did they not have CPS back then? Um, yeah, I know, right? I, I feel like... I feel like someone should have been checking like... in on her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just I got the feeling like Tubbs should have been more alarmed from the beginning, but just throughout the whole episode, people are pretty nonchalant. No one's in a hurry to go anywhere. There's a fast scene where we see an airplane landing, so we know that Valerie's in town. So then after that, we're at the precinct, and Sonny's talking to Tubbs, but Tubbs is somewhere else. He is deep in his own mind, thinking about what he had seen, hearing from Valerie, like all of a sudden all this stuff just came out of left field. Sonny comes in. And it's talking to him about the case that they're actively working on. I need help with this. But Tubbs is barely functioning. Sonny eventually is able to get him out of it. And that's when Valerie comes walking in. Everyone's happy to see each other. Sonny's happy to see Valerie. And then Sonny's, I'll leave you two of birds alone. <laughs> Wink and a finger gun point. Pew! <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's like making it really awkward. He's like, I gotta go. See you later. <laughs> and she walks in in her mime outfit. She just got out of mime school. <laughs> I don't know, mime, old fashioned yeah, clown. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know what she's wearing. <laughs> I don't know what Castillo was doing. As soon as the scene starts, Crockett immediately gives us our excuse of why Castillo is not here. He's off making movies, okay? He's got stuff to do. Uh-huh. Academy Awards. Yeah, he's got Academy Awards to be nominated for. <laughs> It's kind of funny watching Crockett play boss in this scene. He kind of goes out of his way to get Tubbs' attention. And then when Val walks in, he pretty much like, okay, we'll do whatever you want. I'm going to go over, go do this thing. Then when he finally does leave... Long time to leave. <laughs> the slowest exit ever. <laughs> you get the little flirting between Valent and Tubbs. And I love the little business, little pleasure kind of thing. She's here on a little bit of business, a little bit of sweaty pleasure. <laughs> Tubbs is immediately head over heels for her. Like he is to the, he goes to the moon immediately upon seeing her, even though they haven't seen each other in years. Now, there were a couple moments when Tubbs didn't appear in an episode in like season three and season four. And the story was he was in New yes. York with yeah. Valerie. Yeah, he's supposed to be visiting her. Yeah. Even though she treats him like dirt. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, he kind of sort of maybe asks, asks her to dinner. And she kind of maybe says, okay, yeah, I can maybe, do that. I guess. I do got to eat. <laughs> Back harassing 
on why she didn't give up a name at the hospital. And Lynette still can't believe that her mom won't stop protecting Swain. And then Valerie says, you should go into a program. You should get clean. Yvonne says, of course, I've been thinking about that. Uh, I'm definitely going to do that. But by the way, can I have some cash before you leave? And Valerie yeah. it, immediately sees through it and says, I can't believe you're asking me, but then caves because she doesn't want her to go do something extreme to be able to get the money. But don't do it. Exactly. Don't give up that cash. Why did she come there with $300? Like, why would you come yeah, there with $300? Why did she give her so like much? <laughs> <laughs> it's still like $10. Crack is cheap. <laughs> like, why did you give her I'm surprised they saw her at all that weekend. I'm going to go see my junkie friend who has really has big problems with staying clean. And I'm going to bring all the money I have. <laughs> I get that it's Valerie's coming from a different perspective here. You can't hand a drug addict $300, say, okay, I'll see you tomorrow, and expect them to be ready first thing in the morning to go to a drug rehab. Like, exactly. Like, so that's, that's the other point that I was going to say is that she hands it to her and says, okay, fine. Now, tomorrow, we're definitely going to get you into a program. You know, I mean, it's always the best practice to tell a drug addict that tomorrow, mm -hmm. we are going to involuntarily take you to a program. And they're known for just showing up to that. Yeah. You know, that's what they do. Yeah. <laughs> She's never seen intervention, clearly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they just leave them all by themselves with all that money to just, just give be them some responsible. Cash, leave them alone. And not know who their dealer is. Like, that's totally the way that you're supposed to behave. Police officer Valerie Gordon. You can tell she's in robbery homicide. <laughs> Back at the precinct. And now this is the other, like, unbelievable subplot that is happening in this episode. There's this one and there's one more. Stan is on the phone and he is placing a sports bet, like multiple bets. Sonny comes walking in and Stan tries to fake the call, but Sonny is immediately suspicious of what's happening. Stan tries to back his way out of it by saying, I can't believe I used to be that way. Thanks to Rico and Sonny. You guys have really changed my life for me. I really need those meetings bad that I've been going to. Uh, I just really appreciate you guys. And you just see Sonny's face where he's looking at him. I do not believe you for one second, pal. That night out at Raul's, Valerie and Tubbs are having dinner. At first, they're talking shop. And then they switch up to where Tubbs is. He's just drooling all over himself. He <laughs> cannot contain himself around Valerie. He has not had a lady in a long time. Think about it. When was the last time they were like, oh, Tubbs is with his friend or, you know. Uh, that uh, uh, lady that, that was on the island. island. <laughs> you must saw what happened to that poor girl <laughs> yeah I mean, she kind of looked like valerie too like he might have just been on the rebound with that one what about that drug dealer's daughter that or no that lady that they fly in from, from another country and he tells her that she's such a tender lady oh, that yeah, was I this forgot, season oh i forgot about her yeah, but she ended up being a, a, a maniac. She was a murderer. So, you know, she had to die. He did lose her, though, didn't he? <laughs> and this is where I, get, I know Melissa has some thoughts on this. Tubbs says, you're my only habit to Valerie. That he doesn't have anything else in his life. All he he's got is Valerie. That's it. It's all he got. All he has is her, and she treats him like crap. She can't get her well, crap together ever. Like, seriously. He does have a son. <laughs> well, he thinks his son is dead, so <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have anything. <laughs> he doesn't know that that Tubbs Jr. <laughs> is alive. <laughs> so yeah, all he's got is her, and she, and he keeps. He still has a thing for her. He's never gotten over her. He's never gotten any serious about anybody else. There's never been anyone where they're like, oh, Tubbs might get married or, you know, Tubbs might do this. And he's never done any of that. And she still is like, eh, I'm so dysfunctional. I can't <laughs> even function in regular life. So. So when we get to this next scene, this is a powerful scene that we have here. And this is probably one of the more powerful moments that has ever happened in Vice. We're going to come back to Yvonne's and Yvonne is trying to buy. She says, here's $200 for the debt that I owe you. And then here's another $100 to buy. Swain says, no dice. I'm taking all of it and leaving as interest on your debt that you owe me. And I'm leaving. Yvonne throws herself at Swain, begging him, please hook me up. Please use that money to pay me. That when it's clear that he's not going to do that, she says, okay, fine. I'll give you whatever you want, as in my body. I will give you my body. Yeah, you can have me any way too. you want me. That's when Swain stops, turns around and says, I wouldn't do it if you... If you paid me, but then he looks into Lynette's room and you see Yvonne's face turn from 
junky too junky in fear where i i really need a fix but this i know this is wrong and then that's when swain sees the vulnerability and lays it on he pulls out the drugs and shows them to her he tells her that she's gonna get turned eventually why not be me for the first be me be her first and that's when yvonne can't stop herself because he's dangling those drugs a, a, a fair quantity of them in front of her face she takes the drugs swain goes into the room and it, like i i'm watching this i can't believe what i'm watching yeah. during this episode mm -hmm. she even regrets it tries to come in and stop him at first and then he kind of grabs her and throws her to the ground out in the living room at that point she just kind of gives up and she's just staring at the drugs because she's and the look on her face says it it says like like she's realizing at this point as she's uh, as he's got her pinned to the ground that like this is gonna happen and this is her fault this is such a powerful scene and i can see in some respect where they decided to not air this on NBC. But at the same time, this is such an important moment because of the story of a drug addict and the, the situations that their life puts them into and the realism that comes along with it, not the goofy mm -hmm. kind of drug addicts that we've had throughout Miami Vice, but this is, this is legit. This is for real. I'm not suggesting that this happens all the time. But this is through a real-life lens that yeah. they're looking at this. Mm -hmm. And it's actually kind of a shame yeah. that it didn't air. Yeah, it's a real shame it didn't. Because especially going on, uh, the stuff that was going on during that time with people being... The scene ends with Swain, like you see in the distance him leaving and Yvonne still laying on the carpet. And this is where it gets even more difficult. Because then the next day at the precinct, Tubbs comes in whistling and singing and skipping. He is so ecstatic that Valerie is back so in his life. He says that they went to dinner. They didn't. There was nothing else. Yeah, All they dinner. did was go to yeah. dinner. But he is. Oh, yeah. I'm not buying that for one bit. <laughs> Sonny says, go slow, buddy. You know who Valerie is. Do not dive into this head first. And Tubbs says, but it feels so right this time. Oh, Tubbs, 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 Tubbs. <laughs> there are so many subplots happening I here. Know. Where him and yeah. Valerie... Him and Sonny. Tubbs is like, it's so right. But at the same time, everything about the situation is wrong. She's here because her drug addicted friend just got beat up by her drug dealer. She's here for much more serious things. She didn't come there for him. If it wouldn't have been for her mm -hmm. friend, she wasn't going to come there. She doesn't care about him. <laughs> <laughs> he gets a phone call. It's Valerie. And he goes from happy to frantic in 0.3 seconds. He runs out the door. Over at Yvonne's, you see Valerie, and she hangs up the phone crying, lo looking down at her dead friend who has been stabbed, laying in the middle of the room. So then we go later that day out at the beach. They're sitting at like a table outside of a restaurant on the beach. And Valerie is talking to everyone. And she says that I feel so responsible for this because I gave Yvonne that money. She never would have gone to Swain if I wouldn't have given her that money. And Sonny and Tubbs like, because whatever it happened. she is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> she is responsible, and they shouldn't be condescending her. Like, she is totally responsible for this. Had she done a bit, about a billion things different, she probably could have avoided this, starting by not giving her the money. Or how about taking not leaving Lynette? her alone. <laughs> not leaving her daughter with her. Yeah. Exactly. Take Lynette with you. Why would she leave her... Why and what in what world would a police, a policeman or a policewoman, a detective, why would you leave a child with somebody who's clearly not fit to have them? Like, I get it. It's your friend and you were going to put her in a rehab place and you gave her that money. So give her the money and take the kid with you until she goes into the rehab program, because that, yeah, none see, of this, none of that would have happened to her. She would be perfectly safe and nothing would have happened to, happen to, to Lynette. She would have been OK. She wouldn't have been. You know, the, the the fate that she has now would have been nothing. She would have just been had to go live with Valerie. But no. <laughs> and that was but see, and that's something that caught me off guard with Valerie in the episode. Throughout much of the episode, she Valerie's very proud of the fact that she's her goddaughter. But at the same time, like she doesn't display any characteristics parental figure toward Lynette at the end after her mom is, is dead. Like I, I never got the feeling like Lynette was gonna go live with Val. No, she the only reason why I know I know that is because she says that at the end but yeah you're right you never got yeah. that feeling yeah she's like oh yeah i'm her godmother but what kind, i'm just saying like what kind of person like what kind of any adult in a in the in 
a right mind would leave their a, a child with somebody who's so mm-hmm. severely addicted to drugs. Like it doesn't make yeah. any sense. Not not even being a cop, just well, being a regular person. Well, I feel like everything's gotten so heavy in the episode that this would be the perfect time for an Izzy scene. <laughs> <laughs> Sunny runs off. He has an APB out for Lynette because she ran off. The neighbor saw her run off. Valerie and Tubbs go down to the beach and they see Izzy and Manny. Manny. There's a Manny, Manny. appearance. <laughs> We stopped and like, back. is that Manny? <laughs> <laughs> they are now dance instructors and, you know, financial advisors. I mean, you know, yes. what happened to the plants? That's all I could think about. That beautiful, <laughs> that beautiful <laughs> greenhouse he had. Did he lose it to the bank? <laughs> People kept returning fly tra- uh, Venus <laughs> fly, fly tracks. tracks. <laughs> Tubbs and Valerie immediately go to, we're going to blackmail you to get us information. Because that's what they do to poor Izzy. He doesn't, he just minds his own business. But <laughs> Izzy so, tries to seduce Valerie into <laughs> kidding about that he doesn't have the right paperwork to be giving financial advice. <laughs> yeah, I love Izzy. It, when they first ask him about uh, Swain, I don't know. Why would I care about some corner crack dealer? Like, you know, they're not the enterprising type but Tubbs lets him know in a weird way but lets him know that it's super serious and you can see like is he like oh, okay like I'll make it happen but mm-hmm. the way Tubbs kind of tries to get him to know that it's serious is he says something about a nosebleed and I was really confused like is that code for something I don't know like, I, I, he says I, something I like I'm, I'm serious he did kind of feel like yeah. it was a code word maybe he meant he was going to punch Izzy in the nose <laughs> 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 meanwhile Stan is at Gamblers Anonymous or whatever that it, type of called, group it, yeah, is called. Yeah, I think it's called Gamblers Anonymous. Yeah. And you can see he really hates being there. He's listening to someone talk about how they used to be a, gam- a gambling addict and other people are talking. And he takes the first opportunity to run out of there. He's like sweating too. The whole time he's in there, he's like moving around, sweating. Like he can't wait. He's so antsy. That's why he doesn't even wait. He gets in the parking lot, <laughs> uses the payphone <laughs> and makes a bet that he can't keep. Or, and he will never win because he's terrible at betting. <laughs> Utah plus four, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> that night at the hotel, Tubbs and Valerie are talking, and then it's foot rubbing sweaty time. Okay, but gotta make a. But who cares? Who cares if there's a I, missing minor? I was just gonna say that. Yeah, <laughs> gotta so make Tubbs, time for loving. Yeah, Tubbs takes advantage of the situation. I'm sorry. She is like super vulnerable. Her best friend from when they're like childhood is dead. Her goddaughter is missing. But Tubbs is like, I want to have sex with you. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot stop himself. He can't. Like he, As soon as he got around Valerie, everything disappeared. Yeah. He couldn't. It, no. Nothing else mattered in life. anymore. This is why I think that he that they fooled around the first night, too, because he comes in <laughs> just as perky as whistling as he was the second day. It's like two days in a row. And like even Crockett's like, I, I know you got some tail. <laughs> Tubbs says he feels like he's 18 again and that he's just meeting Valerie for the first time. Sunny reminds him, go slow. You haven't seen her in three years. And the last time you did, she murdered someone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's also that. <laughs> Tubbs isn't listening at all, though. All he's thinking about is how great Valerie is and how he's going to ask her to marry him. And Crockett's like, what the? <laughs> what? <laughs> he says he wants to marry her. And Crockett's like, wait a minute. Let's hold the phone here. You don't even really know her at this point. You guys, you know, you've, you've, you've done this before with her. You've done this dance before with her. And then Tubbs drops the whole, well, you know what? Ever since Caitlin died, you've been so closed Ooh. off. And, you know, you haven't been op- open, which is true. Let's let's be honest. Ever since Caitlin died, he's been like, ever since he went around and murdered people, really, that's what it is. When he's did his first changed. wife die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. He's been a changed person. And it, that puts a damper on the conversation. And it gets really icy between the two of them. Because you could tell Crockett's like, don't you bring up Caitlin to me. Collectively, the entire office loosened their collar and went, ee. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You could see the tension between them when they go to leave. It's like, oh, yeah, we're, he's like, well, you know, I hope we'll, I'll see you around. And Tubbs is like, we're working the same case. So, yeah, I'll see you. Well, and that's the thing is like, they're supposed to be working the same case, I think. It feels like Crockett in these interactions with Tubbs, Crockett keeps trying to get him to like, hey, man, what's going on? 
what's going on with this case, you know, or like, can I help? You know, like he wants to be more involved. Tubbs seems to be shutting him out. Like he doesn't want him to have anything to do with him and Valerie, whatever's going on with the case. He's really not a part of the case, or at least they're not letting him be a part of it. The thing is, is that Tubbs is not doing anything for the case. All he's doing is swooning over Valerie. What has he done except for go to Izzy? Because it's like, it's really seriously like he does not care about this girl. He's just so distracted by Valerie being there and being like, I'm going to, like, none of this should be, none of that should be like him getting married and them having sex and all that. None of that should take the place of the fact that they have to find that girl, right? But it all makes sense later on why there's no, like, why there's no rush from Valerie. But at this point, you don't know what's going to happen. So, but it seems like Tug yeah. doesn't give a crap. He's like, oh yeah, whatever. We'll find that girl. She's all right. <laughs> she, saw <laughs> that, she saw her mom get murdered. You know, she'll be cool though. We'll uh, find her. <laughs> that's true. Because Crockett even has to kind of at the end of the scene re- remind him, like, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, what about that missing girl? Like, let's get on that. Because it seems like Crockett's out there has actually been out there looking, and he's like done things. Like, he's the one that put up the APB. He's doing all our stuff. But Tubbs is like, no, I'm just too busy trying to figure out a way to get Valerie in bed. And this is another one of those subplots as a lead to freefall. Mm-hmm. The Tubbs and Crockett relationship is rocky. Yeah, it's everything. Stan, everything it, is rocky. He his gambling mm-hmm. is out of control. Yep. Izzy it's, is done it's, dealing with them. And they mention later in a scene, it's like they say, when we retire, we'll give you our pension. Like he's done dealing with them. Yeah. And I've, I don't know if you notice it, but later on in the scene, when, when they deal with him again, he's very, is he very serious? He's not his like light jovial, you know, how he like mm. messes around with him. He's very serious. He's like, just be careful. He gives them the information like, here you go. But be careful, guys. He's All mean. of these subplots mm-hmm. lead directly into Freefall. Yeah. Can you, you can imagine watching yeah. it without watching this and then watching Freefall, you guys would be lost. You'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> Oh Man, yeah, and, and like <laughs> <laughs> not only is there a divide between Crockett and Tubbs, and then Stan with his gambling, no one's even noticed that both the girls have completely have transferred out <laughs> of the department. They're completely gone. <laughs> both the girls haven't been in either. They weren't in the last episode either, right? They just make like these random appearances where they like here you go, and they hand a paper. They, and no, they weren't because it was the Joey Harden one, so they yeah. weren't in that left. Yeah, okay, so they haven't been in. Yeah. Yet. What about dad? Maybe yeah, dad's no, dead. No, no, no. <laughs> Tr- Trudy transferred down to New, or- New Orleans. Gina finally got arrested for being a black widow and murdering another guy. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs leaves and goes and picks up Valerie. She knows where Lynette would run off to when she's had problems before, so they're going to go to this park. Miraculously, she knows all of a sudden where she's at. Lynette, she gets up, runs away from Tubbs, straight to Valerie, and then immediately says... Swain raped her, which is obviously 100% true here. Yeah. But mm-hmm. the situation is as set up as it can be yeah. for Tubbs to overhear and see everything. So now back at Metro Dade headquarters, they have Valerie and the duo are there. And a doctor comes in to talk to Lynette. Cause now that Lynette is in custody, they like to interview her and talk to her and help. The doctor like to help her dealing with the trauma that she's experienced. But Valerie immediately stonewalls the doctor. The doctor leaves oh, yeah. in frustration. And then she tells the duo, how about you two get off your ass and go find this guy? She goes, yeah, don't you guys care yeah. about finding this Swain at all? It doesn't seem like you're doing anything. And the whole time Crockett has this look on his face like, hmm, something's not right here. Like as soon as she starts telling the doctor, like, no, you can't go in there and talk to her. I don't care. Whatever, blah, blah, blah. He gives, basically tells her, like, you guys need to work harder. Like, get on this. And it's funny because all of this is kind of still kind of her fault. <laughs> all of it is all. It's all her fault. <laughs> <laughs> At stands, he's watching the sports highlights and realizes that he has lost every single one of his bets. He turns off the TV and picks up one of the snow globes that's from Zito looking at yep. it. And then that's when he hears his car alarm going off, races outside, and sees his car is being towed. The driver says, this will at least settle for what you owe us after tonight, because you had such a disastrous night. And Stan just starts yelling, stay out of my life, steals the tow truck, and drives away with it. Yeah, he's not thinking clearly. And I know this is another kind of heavy scene, but at the same time, I laughed out loud when he he (laughs) stole that repo truck, when he stole the tow truck. like, Like, that was fantastic. That's one way to get him from stealing your car. You steal their yes. car. <laughs> yes. Dude, he just takes off driving like gunsy. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the hotel, Tubbs is trying to talk to Valerie. She says she needs more time. I'm busy with this, you know, with my Both goddaughter <laughs> and stuff. And Tubbs says, I know this is the wrong time, but we're not young anymore. I love you very much. Will you marry me? And Valerie 
surprised, says, I need to be here for Lynette. Doesn't give an answer. Tubbs then says, did you hear me? And Valerie says, yeah, I did. And then the saddest puppy dog <laughs> in all of TV <laughs> gets up and slowly walks away. So Someone get him. Someone <laughs> give Tubbs a, a hug. A high five, like rub his head or something. I don't know. He is so sad. It's the saddest I've ever seen anyone. <laughs> okay, he's sad. I get it. But that was not, that was the worst timing ever. Yeah. I have my granddaughter. Yeah, She's been raped. Will you marry me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know you're dealing with a rape, but hear me out. <laughs> hear me out. I mean, he does pitch it as like, I could help you. You, you're going to take her. She's going to live with you. I can help you like with her. We could do it together. And, you know, it's just not the right time. He's just being, he's she being did, selfish. This whole episode she, has been selfish. <laughs> she didn't even want to come from New York. She's here because she has to be. She's not here. To, oh, it was so optimistic going in too. I'm going to get laid three <laughs> nights in a row. She's going to marry me. We're going to have a family. So Tubbs leaves from there and goes down to the bar to go talk to Sonny, who they are both waiting for Izzy to come back with information about Swain. Tub says this case is getting between him and Valerie, and Sonny's like, yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> Tubbs says, you want to go? I yeah. heard that attitude yeah, in exactly. that. Yeah, you exactly. You have something to say, basically? <laughs> Sonny eventually says he thinks there's something fishy about Valerie's involvement. She's hiding the kid. She knew exactly where Lynette was. There's something wrong about this. Tubbs does not want to hear any of it and goes to storm out. And he runs into Izzy, and Izzy can see and hear the tension between them. And he very methodically just says, here's the information to the Cordero's crack house. Swain is there every night to get his deal. Be careful. He's a dangerous dude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, kind of like, here you go. Now don't ask me for anything else. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, he doesn't want anything to do with it. At stands, he gets woken up by some mobsters who say... They're not going to tolerate his behavior anymore. You owe us. <laughs> Have we you seen our tow truck? You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. you owe us. We own you. And you need to do us a favor. Not saying what the favor is yet, but you owe us a favor. Stan is in deep shit. He's in deeper. Yes. How did he do it? How did he do it? get deeper than he was before? I mean, he murdered people before, but he's in deeper than he was. <laughs> <laughs> Out at Cordero's Crack House Emporium. Cordero and Swain are doing business. Swain has a major attitude with Cordero, and Cordero calls him out on it to say, and he tells him, I don't know why you have such a big attitude of being such a small time dealer. You're such a pain in the ass. To yeah, deal you, with. you don't trust me because he's like counting, he's like going through every single thing individually, and he's like, You don't trust me? I'm sure. <laughs> Swain pulls his I'll tell you this. It's a pretty clean crack den they got there. I mean, compared to most crack dens, like <laughs> Swain pulls his knife. He says, "Once I get a new dealer, I'm going to be king of the streets. Once I can get off of you, I yeah, get to I someone know. for real." I don't know what he was trying <laughs> to say. Swain leaves, but the duo are waiting for him. And, you know, you may not notice a Ferrari parked across the street of a crack house. You may not know. They may not think that's weird. No, I guess not. It's Miami yeah. Vice. That um, happens all the time. <laughs> so they take Swain down to Metro Dade headquarters, and they have Valerie and Lynette in the room to identify Swain in a lineup. Swain is there, but Lynette refuses to acknowledge that he's there. She says, I don't see him. And it's very, very suspicious, so much so that the duo later when they're walking out, Sonny says, something is not adding up here. I've never seen a witness break down that much. This was a slam dunk. There is something off here. So then at the hotel, Tubbs goes and talks to Valerie. He confronts her about her involvement, and she admits that she was hiding Lynette while they got their stories straight. Oh, and just let's just compound how much of a moron Val's been about this whole situation by leaving her goddaughter, who is still reeling alone, to take a walk and leaving her alone in a room with her gun. Also, like, come on, Valerie. Also, Valerie knows at this point, we don't know as a viewer, but Valerie knows that Lynette killed her mom. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then leaves her alone with access to a gun. Yeah, she's clearly not in her right mind. Yeah, it's just, I don't know what Val's thing. She is way out of her element, apparently, with Lynette. Tubbs, frustrated, 
calls the precinct and says they need to get someone over to Swain's place because that's clearly where Lynette is going. Tubbs is extremely How are they having mad so much at- trouble finding him, but they know where he lives. <laughs> I know. I thought that too. I was like, oh. Tubbs is extremely mad about the entire thing and all the stuff that Valerie hasn't been telling him. And he even says, so what else haven't you told me? But then we're going to go over to Swain's and Lynette is there. Swain's pretty happy with himself. He's rubbing her neck and telling her about you came back to me. But then he slowly starts to get suspicious of Lynette being there. Says, does your mom know you're here? Because he's thinking hit her mom, Yvonne, sent her there. That way she'll get drugs for her. Like a down payment. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, is this like mm-hmm. some kind of deal you're doing for your mom? And she's like, no. <laughs> no, mom's dead and that's when swain she is OD'd? really <laughs> out of his element and that's what and then lynette turns around with a gun and says that after swain left she talked to her mom and her mom blamed her for crying and said get used to swain coming over and that's when she blacked out and then looked down and saw that a knife was sticking out of her mom's back now she's going to take care of swain and just close the whole deal here for what the world her world has done to her at the last moment Tubbs and valerie come busting in valerie slowly takes the gun away from lynette but there's an incredible camera job here where you're looking down the scope of the gun and you can see she pauses the gun on swain for a brief moment the way she takes the gun she takes it in front of swain and pauses for a brief moment and then takes it away as if she was hoping that an accidental firing would happen or something along yeah, those something, lines. Something would take him out anyway. Tubbs says Swain's going to jail for a long time. And then we cut back to Metro Dade headquarters. So I kind of wish they kind of let us in on what they're all charging him up. Cause like he's saying like, Oh, he's going to go away for a long time to be They're going to charge him with, with rape because she's going to testify now. They'll charge him with rape because oh. she's going to testify now and say like, that that's why that's, she did it. That's what I kind of assumed, but I was, I was wondering like, is there more to this or, you know, he's got drugs at his place. They know he's a drug dealer. They've caught, they, they caught him, arrested him outside of doing drug deals. I think what's happening here and what John is talking about is that he just wishes there was a little bit more information. Not yeah. necessarily saying you had to go really detailed because when we get to Metro Dade headquarters, yeah. Valerie is clearly in an interrogation room, and I thought she was going to be charged with like obstruction of justice or something yes. along those lines. Yeah, but this conversation doesn't indicate any of that, but it even ends no. with Valerie saying, "I'm going to go back to New York. I'm going to turn in my badge." All they All talk right. about is Lynette. They say that they're hoping that the courts will work it out and that she won't get any time. And they talk about, like, they don't talk about Swain at all. So you're right. It isn't, it isn't clear. It, I think they're just trying to shift the focus completely from that to Valerie altogether. But you're right. It's not clear. Like, why is she, is she's just going to turn in her badge because she's been a bad cop because of all the stuff she's done in the last two days. But she, I mean, she was a bad cop before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, should she be being arrested for obstructing justice or something? Like, like should there be more than I'm just going to fly home, take a few days, and then I'll probably turn my badge in? <laughs> it's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it, true. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'm saying. It's like, there just needed to be a little bit more information. Just like a few lines says, oh, this person's being charged with this. This is what's happening. Luckily, the yes. judge ruled in your favor, so you're free to go. Like, that kind of thing. Yeah. But in true vice fashion, they're just hoping you make it up all in your head. That <laughs> it all works out for Lynette. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll just be nice. A little bit of clarification. Just a little bit. Tubbs does say Lynette is with the juvenile authorities. They're going to take care of her. Valerie says, what are they supposed to do? Turn her in for murder. Tub says, you framed a guy for murder. And Valerie says, what, you've never done that before? <laughs> yeah, Tub uh, like, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, actually, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie says she's burned out. And then that's when she says she's going to go back and she's just going to turn stuff in. But she does say, not all of it was fake. And I wasn't lying about everything. And she looks at Tubbs and Tubbs just says, woman. Valerie says that she's sorry, leaves, says she's going to go turn in her badge. And the episode slowly fades out on sad tubs just sitting alone sad, in that room. Sad tubs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, to be fair, she never said no. So marriage might still be on the table. <laughs> this episode was, I, I mean, I knew ahead of time what the rough plot was going to be. But just across the board, it's an amazing episode of Miami Vice. And clearly a forerunner for what was going to happen with cop shows. And it still baffles the mind that this didn't air 
that this was considered to be too risque for NBC in 1989. And I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm going to save that for our final thought. Well, before we get there, let's go talk about this week's music. Again, music from an episode with new artists. So I'm looking forward to this one, especially because we're so close to 1990 and my heyday of music. So I love hearing about artists that I love. <laughs> let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, this week we got some new music and I am pumped to hear about them because one of them, I am a huge fan. Me too. I am a huge fan of Tim Truman and Phil Perry, just like you are. <laughs> no, no, but let's start there. Let's start with Tim Truman and Phil Perry's Help Me Through the Night. And I want to start here because this, we talked about it before the season that when to Tim Truman took over with the music that he made several songs for the show that were just supposed to be kind of like popular rock songs to try and save money rather than just going out and getting Phil Collins every time. <laughs> hey, he costs a lot of money, Phil Collins. He's expensive. This is his last Made for Vice song. In true fashion, it was never released outside of Vice on anything except a bootleg soundtrack. I want that soundtrack. Now, Phil Perry, who is the singer in the song, he's quite famous. He was an R&B singer, songwriter, and musician. He was an original member of the soul group The Montclairs. From 71 to 75, he'd record a couple albums with the Montclairs. The Montclairs would break up in 1975. Phil Perry would move to California with one of his other fellow members, Kevin Sandlin. They would put out two albums as a duo, but only the song Just to Make You Happy would get any kind of radio play. Going into the 90s, he would cover Call Me, which was an Aretha Franklin hit. It would be his first number one and would lead to top 40 hits Amazing Love and Forever. Also on his first solo record, he's released more than 10 al solo albums, as well as being a primary vocalist on the number of big name jazz artist recordings. Some of his songs have appeared on soundchecks for some pretty big movies like Roots, Pretty in Pink, Short Circuit, and Captain Ron. Our next artist is Mink DeVille with the song Mixed Up, Shook Up Girl. Mink DeVille is a rock band known for its association with early punk rock bands. They were a feature band at New York's famous CBGB nightclub and are known for being a showcase for the music of Willie DeVille. All in all, the band recorded six albums, but except for frontman Willie DeVille, the original band members only played on the first two albums. The remaining albums, Willie would assemble musicians, and then in 85, he would start bringing in backup bands and would perform under the name Willie DeVille instead of Willie would go on and have a 35 year career and actually create his own genre considered Spanish Americana of music. He re released a ton of albums and is considered to be pretty in influential. So a little history about the band. They were formed in 74 when members who was then called Billy Borse, Thomas Manfred Allen Jr. and bassist Ruben met on the San Francisco music scene. I love that there's all these people have so many different names. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> the first iteration of the band was called Billy D. Sade and the Marquettes. Remember, his name was Billy Borsay back then. In the band's own words, that they said they played mostly leather bars on Folsom Ave. So in 75, when he changed the name of the band from Mink DeVille, he changed his name from Billy Borsay to Willie DeVille. In that same year, they tried out and were named one of the original house bands at the club CBGB. Now, they weren't getting paid nothing. They were getting paid 50 bucks a night at the time. Like, late 70s, CBGB was just, that was the beginning of the punk scene. And so, and that's why them, Willie DeVille being a house band there, is kind of odd, because he was more soul and R&B music than punk. He would also get married at the time to... I kid you not. Toots DeVille. <laughs> Toots, by the way, her and Willie were known for excessive drug use and outlandish behavior. Toots, apparently very jealous type. She was known for pulling knives on women who would flirt with Willie. <laughs> I can't uh, believe you would say such bad things about a woman named Toots. <laughs> Toots. <laughs> She's got a Tootsie down a little bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> After being a house band there, he'd go on to have a solo career. And even though the commercial success kind of waxed and waned over the years, he left a legacy as a songwriter, and he's known for influencing a crap ton of artists. All right, our last artist is Public Enemy. You gotta get yours. And Public Enemy, obviously, the uh, infamous hip-hop group, from the 90s, featured members Chuck D, Flavor Flav, Professor Griff, Kari Wynn, DJ Lord, Sammy Sam, and S1W Group. No, I am not going to name everyone in S1W Group. <laughs> There's like 30 of them. Other members have included Terminator X, Sister Soldier, and DJ Juice. Before you get too far into it, John, I will say one of my favorite concerts I've ever been to and one of the biggest memories I have of one of the biggest bands I've ever seen is I've seen I saw a public enemy perform on the Smoking Groove store and they closed out the show. They came on stage after Cypress Hill. So that was an amazing set. Oh, wow. Public Enemy was formed in Long Island, New York in 1986. They are known for their politically charged music and for helping usher it in the golden age of hip-hop which i don't think you would argue they are up there with artists like run dmc and nwa as far as like the forefathers of hip-hop absolutely yeah their first four albums in the late 80s and early 90s were all certified gold or platinum but let's get back to the start in the beginning in uh, about 1986 Carlton Reidenauer and William Drayton met at Long <laughs> Island's prestigious Adelphi University. While developing their talents as MCs, Carlton was also delivering furniture for his dad's furniture business. He would form his first group, Chuck D and Spectrum City. They would release the album Check Out the Radio, follow that up, but with an album Lies. Neither album was particularly big, but at the time, Chuck D was also working part-time at a radio station, and he was able to get his song Public Enemy Number 1 to get on the radio to get some regular play. I guess apparently he was beefing with some other rappers in the area. So, like, they played that song, and it kind of worked out that the former... Uh, program director at that radio station he worked at he was hired by Def Jam during that time to help a struggling producer named Rick Rubin and he helped Rick mm. Rubin sign Chuck D wow yeah like that's a, that's a seriously big name to just come out of nowhere and to be the guy like Rick Rubin broke out with Chuck D and Public Enemy, who would form after that. So Carlton Reidenauer is Chuck D. He would bring along the Spectrum City. And that's also when they would bring on Professor Griff and Flavor Flav, who was already work who was already who was William Dryden, who was already working with them. So believe it or not, their very first thing that they did was they started out as an opening act for the Beastie Boys during their uh -huh. License to Ill tour. Uh -huh. And then in 1987, they released their debut album under Public Enemy called Yo! Bum Rush the Show. Their first album would be released to critical acclaim. Their second album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back in 88, would include hits Don't Believe the Hype and Bring the Noise. Their third album... Fear of a Black Planet, released in 90, would be their most successful album. Guys, pretty big deal. That album, in 2005, was selected for preservation by the Library of Congress. Damn. It features hits like Fight the Power, is like an anthem, was like an anthem, still is like an anthem in hip-hop, and was the theme to Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Like I said, their first four albums were gold or platinum immediately, so they immediately saw success. 1994, Terminator X, a.k.a. Norman Rogers, would get in a motorcycle accident, and shatter his left leg. He would relocate to a 15, his 15-acre fifth, ranch in North Carolina, and eventually he would start stop touring more and, and eventually retire in 1998. So in 98, he was replaced by DJ Lord, a.k.a. Lord Aswad. <laughs> yes, you heard that correctly. <laughs> Lord A-S-W-O-D. Public Enemy never actually broke up. They released their 13th album, July 2015. Damn. Around, and they've also started, Chuck D has been working on a PE 2.0 project, standing for Public Enemy 2.0, with Oakland rapper Jahi, who he has said is his 
going to be a spiritual successor. They met at a performance at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999. And I think what that's about is I think they were insanely popular throughout the 90s. Like by the time the 2000s came, they didn't have to tour as much. They didn't have to do as much. About that time, Flavor Flav, uh, and I mean Flavor, I could, if I wanted to go in depth into Chuck D or just Flavor Flav. I can do a whole segment on just Flavor Flav or just Chuck <laughs> D. Let's put it this way. Flavor Flav did 90 days in jail for attempted murder for shooting a gun at his neighbor. Like, And that's just one of many stories. It was about the 2000s. Flavor Flav was starting to struggle with drug addiction. He got clean, did Flavor of Love and a series of reality shows, as well as having a relationship with Brigitte Nielsen, which was weird in its own right. And while he was doing that, Chuck D was actually still has was still releasing stuff with Public Enemy. But I think the idea of Public Enemy 2.0 was Chuck D kind of saying like, I'm going to step back, but you guys can keep touring under the Public Enemy name. Chuck D has been grooming other uh, rappers, and he he still thinks it's very important that rappers be political, and that he's afraid of like what happens to rap if that's not a part of it. And he's not alone in that, but I did hear him in an interview that he did the Combat Jack show, God Bless the Dead, Combat Jack, where he was talking, he mm-hmm. talked about that, and he talked about how important it is, and he's not the only one that's that that's that way. KRS One was a very political rapper in his time is still that way still very important to him grooming rappers to do that and there were so many yeah. of them from that generation that did that that's so important like a tribe called quest boogie down productions like the, there's so many yeah. political rappers from that era chuck d is just a historical figure out of all of the guys in public enemy like if you're making a mount rushmore chuck d's the guy in the group that's getting put up there in my opinion absolutely and they were inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame rightfully so in 2013 and aside from some of the craziness with flavor in the 2000s with his reality show stuff and i mean for the most part they never broke up they still exist they can they can they'll they still drop albums and they'll still go on tours when they feel like it when i usually do this with these big name groups it goes one of two ways either it's full of drug addiction and car crashes and and band members being replaced or it it reads like they're winning a lifetime achievement award or something and that's kind of what their biography reads like they were huge they were super popular but there's nothing like there were no riots it shows like there was controversy over the topics in their music and the in the lyrics but there was never anything like some of these bands where it's like they were too stoned to go on stage or stuff like that like they've They've been enormously successful and everything is just kind of, and they've continued to be successful for years. We're looking at you, Guns N' Roses. (laughs) I knew Public Enemy was going to be full of stuff. Yeah. Just didn't see asphalt coming. (laughs) (laughs) Like John mentioned, we could go on and on and on and on and on about Public Enemy, but we got to go give our final thoughts about this week's episode. Um, And we got to get ready for free fall. So this is, this is basically free fall part one. Yeah. (laughs) Let's go. Give our final thoughts. All right, Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I'm sad that this episode didn't get, it's like the air that it should have got. It should have been in their first run. It should have been the sub. I understand that what the, the, the network is saying, that the subject matter is sensitive and I totally get that. But I feel like they didn't do it in a vulgar way. It was very well um, written and very well filmed and everything. You, you understood what was going on without having to see it. And it's, it's a very sad subject. But I also feel that there's so much important information in this episode that it's almost like robbing some people of their stories. I want to know, like, why, why is, you know, why is Stan the way he is? Like, and you're going to see it in Freefall, what happens to him as a, you know, as a result of what he's done. But if you didn't have that, you would be so lost. Like, also, like, give him his, give him his story. Like, give him what you're supposed to. Let it play out. You wrote it. Play it out. Like the part where he's got the snow globe in his hand, and you're like, oh my god. Like, let's look at the. And you look around his house, and he has all those snow globes in his house, like because he took them when when Vito died. He's the one that ended up with them, and like all mm-hmm. that. And also when the mobsters come to his house, and the and he's got the snow globe in his hand, and he's like turning it around, and there's like. There's just so much symbolism in that. And it's sad that like that if you, you didn't get to see it when it first came out. Obviously, the the most important thing I think about this episode is the the relationship between Crockett and Tubbs and how shaky it really is. 
that all it took was for Valerie to come into town and for them to be like, you know what, let's take the gloves off. Like, Crockett, you've never been the same since Caitlin died. And Tubbs is like, I'm lonely. Like, that's what it is. Like, he's lonely. That life that they're leaving, that they're leading right now is not, it's not good for either one of them, basically. John, what are your final thoughts? I agree with you about it should have aired. And I'm going to take it one step further. It's a shame that this episode didn't make it to air during the original run. When they did the show, Miami Vice, the idea of it being MTV cops, but at the same time, and, and you can tell once Dip Wolf took over, especially that it was trying, they were trying to push the envelope as much as they could while still bringing enough levity in there to not be to not be too far but this is such a fantastic episode and it is so ahead of its time this is something that it took literally until the 2000s before any any show even went close to touching broaching this this topic on network tv not not cable but it, i mean just on network tv i feel like if this show had aired in the original run it would have would have broken tv and it could have and, and probably in a good way and it could have saved maybe even saved the show i mean i know at this point in the show or at this point in the series got people were moving on we haven't seen castile because he's making movies we know don johnson wants to make movies but the rest of the people were still kind of stuck in that contract where they couldn't really do anything outside of vice and like this episode would have it would have wrecked tv on like no one would have known how to respond to uh to something this serious this close to the reality of, of addiction and and the type of stuff that go, you know and that type of stuff that's such a serious topic now i think it's a shame it's a shame that it, they didn't let it run before free fall because i think it would have i i think i think if it wouldn't have saved the show it would still have changed a lot of people's opinions on what they thought think about miami vice looking back yeah i agree with you guys across the board and just want to point out that Three of the four lost episodes we felt were some of the best episodes of the season. And when they made the executive decision that after some bad episodes of Vice came out, they already knew it was going to be the last episode. There was a writer's strike, so put it later in in 1989 than they wanted it to be. They made the decision to cut the season short. I wonder why they decided to just leave it and then just air free fall at episode 17. They picked a date and we'll just air that. Instead of saying, okay, let's dump Victims of Circumstance, which now is a mm -hmm. pointless episode. They should have dumped that and put this one in its spot. Instead of mm -hmm. just letting it go and then and, and then just dumping Freefall into there, they should have taken some of these lost episodes and put them into the regular run. So if they decided at, at, at episode 10, we're going to stop at 17, then take out Victims of Circumstance, take out some of the other ones that aired before then, and put in mm -hmm. these lost episodes, which leads yeah. me to wonder when they stopped it at episode 17 on NBC, what did they air in its place of the four more weeks that they could have had Vice on? What was on at 10 o'clock on Friday nights? I have a feeling it's my Vice reruns that that's what was on yeah. air that where they could have aired these lost episodes instead, which would have made way more sense. And obviously, we haven't watched Free Fall yet. You could see the deterioration. You can see Tubbs and Crockett getting further and further apart. You could see the spiral of Stan. Had I not seen this, I don't know if I would be as prepared for Free Fall as I'm probably going to be. To finish up my final thoughts, like this is my one of my favorite from this season. And we are really far away from amnesia, so it's easy to forget like how good the amnesia storylines were. But that also in retrospect feels like a lot like a ratings grab. They were desperate to try and make something so that people would come back to Vice. And it turns out they may have been wrong. That if they made more episodes like this and then more of the episodes where they have a little bit of fun, like Miracle Man. People would have come back to the show, but they turned it into the Sunny mm -hmm. Crockett show, and that could only go so far. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. We only have a few more weeks left. We would love to hear from you. Email us, heat at gmail.com. Check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to show your support. We would love to see your support in these final few weeks before we officially retire from the Go With The Heat podcast at Miami Vice. So go to that website, click on contact us, see all the ways that you can get a hold of us. You know, you can get us on Twitter. 
at go with the heat instagram at go with the heat facebook at go with the heat you know where we're at you can get a hold of us you can go to your podcast your platform of choice leave us a review you can email us go with the heat at gmail.com hell next week i might even say that we have a phone number it might be something like one eight nine nine go with the heat <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time bye pal